So hi everyone, welcome to Sunny. This is a podcast that celebrates African scientists and a very special welcome to everyone for our first episode of the year. My name is Alex Nyako, I'm your host and I am a senior research specialist at Avery Denison and today I'm hosting a podcast with Salasi Wiafekwache and I am a postdoc at the University of Maine. Today we are joined by Dr. Thomas Tego, a lecturer at the Department of Physiology at the University of Ghana and the Chief Operations Officer at GH Scientific. So hello, Dr. Tego. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you for having me. Uh, hello, Selassie. Hello, Alex. Uh, great to be here to join you and have this conversation. So we usually like to begin our conversation with our interview- interviewees, um, really trying to go back and trying to understand more of their background, knowing more of um, their career journey, how did your past experiences, how did your upbringing, how did your schooling influence and shape your career path and field that you currently pursue? Right, yeah, um, sure. So how, how, how far back do we want to go? Because we go <laughs> <laughs> like toddler years. Um, yeah, so it's, it's I, I wouldn't say I had a, one of those stories that was, you know, um, set in stone right from the beginning. You know, you occasionally have some people who knew uh, very early on what they wanted um, in life, but um, I wasn't one of those. Uh, the earliest that I, I did want to be was um, to um, work in some shape or form with animals. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. So if, like I'd, I'd get home after school and I'm the one who'd be watching like National Geographic channel and, you know, get really excited about that and, and want to be like David Attenborough sort of person. Um, mm-hmm. but I would, I, I never really thought of a, a path that would, that would lead to that. Um, I would say where I am now probably start coming into being during my undergraduate years. Um, I did my undergraduate at the University of Leicester in the UK. Mm-hmm. And uh, the course that I, I took was in biological sciences. And it gave a very broad introduction to all fields of the biological sciences, right? Uh, human, animal, plants, you know, very broad intro. But as you moved on through the, through the course, through the years, um, it narrowed down and it allowed each individual to sort of choose a niche uh, that really worked out for for them and that's how i um ended up in physiology that's how i found um my way into into neuroscience um yeah it's 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 one of those um i i would add that my my interests were really um in two particular areas which one was in neuroscience um the other was in genetics um Mm -hmm. and at the heart of both of these things is the you know it's 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 at the heart of who we are as a human being right your genetics end up defining you um and your brain your nervous system is you <laughs> you know it's it's all that um you are so those were my two primary areas of interest um and i tell the story to students sometimes and they ask me so how did you choose between the two and i finally tell them that well my final grades uh, I, in genetics, I got like a fifty-nine percent, um, and in neuroscience, I got like a seventy-four percent. So you know, it's very easy to de- to, to 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 narrow down who, where I then decided to apply myself, having an interest, being good at it, and then uh, once I go into a PhD, there is this history, as they like to say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really shaped by the influence from the undergraduate studies. Um, could you shed some light on, was it the, the way a particular teacher uh, directed the way they taught or what was the really fundamental reason for that interest bubbling up? Um, I, I would say it was um, very general, like the, the subject area. Um, I wouldn't narrow it down to um, any, any particular teacher in terms of the um, interest coming at that point um but i could probably pick it up in terms of direct influence being from like my phd supervisor right mm-hmm. and that's been 
um, after undergrad, of course. Um, and, you know, she really allowed me to grow into who I am now. I say it was my greatest learning experience in life uh, ever, um, not just academically, but also, you know, as an individual, just personal growth um because you know being committed to something for so long and and doing that and having someone guide you through that process challenge you through that process uh point out your your glaring flaws that you need to work on um through that process was was uh, you know very uh formative for me but the undergrad years it was yeah you just study you pursue your interests and you pursue mm -hmm. what you're good at and um see where where it all leads yeah. That's also a, a, a very different story than what uh, people might also be um, more usually expecting. And so um, we want to know more about your current research focus in the field of neuroscience in layman terms so that our listeners can appreciate what neuroscience is all about. And then what are the main areas of problems that your research is trying to address? Okay, all right, sure. So I think if you if you recollect, I said uh, fundamentally what drew me to uh, neuroscience is that you know the brain is at the heart of who we are, right? Now um, the brain exhibits a very interesting property uh, that is called plasticity or neuroplasticity, depending on you know we can just use plasticity. Now all this is is um, it embodies the ability of the brain to change you know whether it's a structure or its function based on experience okay so things that we go through all the time can influence um what the brain then becomes and you know it's, it's easy for us to think about it right if you consider a a child from birth who doesn't have any language capabilities but as you expose them to language and, you know, society and so on, they then pick up whatever language they are exposed to and they, they become molded to whatever they experience. So that, that is plasticity and plasticity and it's at the heart of who we are. So uh, this is what I, I study, really. Um, how the environment can influence this property of the brain to keep on changing. Because if the brain can change, then, you know, you, you think about everything we know about mental health, everything we know about experiences, about trauma, and things like that. All of those things are subject to change and potentially the experiences people go through can change that. So there's a specific um, sort of tool that is used. It's called environmental enrichment. And this is one of the ways to then be able to alter the experiences that influence the plasticity. So the environmental enrichment um, basically puts all the experiences into four areas, like physical experience. So, you know, things that you do with the body and you're actually experiencing that uh, aspect. Um, social experiences, which are, of course, your interactions with other people, uh, preferably of the same species, but social uh, inter interactions, um, cognitive interactions. So um, things that stimulate your brain and challenge you to really think and uh, use those brain cells. And lastly, sensory experiences. So sights, smells, tastes and touch and all of that. All those avenues, depending on how we modulate those experiences, forms this idea of environmental enrichment and that environmental enrichment has the potential to play around with your brain's ability to change its structure and function in response to these experiences yeah thanks for that insight um so when you were talking one question that came to mind was this argument of nature versus nurture um yeah so does your research touch up on that and what are, what are your thoughts on that argument as well that's interesting uh th thanks for that because you know that's like genetics versus neuroscience right okay. um, where genetics is the nature and so like neuroscience being, being the nature so yeah my, my interests have, have always been um along these two so um yeah i i can share something um about them which is a bit of both 
right? There's a element of um, significant elements of nature which determines, you know, who we are and what we become um, because it's imprinted in the genes. But then mm-hmm. there's also the fact that you are a blank slate um, and every experience then builds up on it. Even on the genetics side of things, you know, more and more we get some evidence to suggest that the things that you go through in life have a way to modify how your genes are read. Okay. Um, and there are a number of different studies that have let us know that it's not just about nature, but the extent of the nature also really matters. And these studies are usually like um, twin, twin uh, cohort studies where for one reason or the other, you had twins at birth who have been separated and have ended up living very different lives. Right. And then later on, these twins are brought together and you can see that although genetically they are identical based on what they have all been nurtured and how they have all been sort of like brought up and so on, these twins end up being different on a number of different um, markets and and, and parameters. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. a bit of both. Um, Nature is great. It gives you a, it defines your starting point. Um, but it doesn't necessarily define your your end point. Yeah, that's that's amazing. It's it, it, it's I like the way you said it. it nature defines your starting point, but it doesn't necessarily um, go take define you to your to, end point. Uh, yeah, yeah, to the end point. Um, and so we would like to switch just a little bit. Um, we know that you are the chief operations officer at gh scientific can you tell us more about gh scientific and what are your main objectives and some light on some of your major achievements yeah sure um so so gh scientific is a it's it's it's, it's a brainchild i started with uh my sister actually we co-founded it t- together um she she plays the role of the uh chief executive and director and i uh, obviously um operations uh, but we started this um back in 2014 2015 uh there thereabouts when i was returning to ghana from the uk i had just you know graduated with my phd in hand all super excited uh, just coming to ghana you know to come and see what the landscape uh, looks like because i've been away for for many years um and in looking at this we realized that there wasn't a source of information to know what was happening scientifically in Ghana. There, there wasn't a place that one could get such ready-made information. So we we had the idea to, to start that. What started out as just a, a news blog site and so on, developed into something much uh, bigger. So that now uh, GA Scientific is essentially um, building capacity in the science and tech spaces uh, through a lot of public engagement and outreach activities. Um, and we do this in the sense that we provide the spaces for, let's say, postdocs, young faculty, um, even um, postgrads, right? To volunteer on projects that we've designed. And in so doing, they gain experience, they learn lessons, they have the space to also give back to society. And these projects are designed to then build capacity in younger students. So we're talking about like experiential days for different sciences or, you know, project based learning activities or even, you know, fairs and festivals and and things like that. So we end up, you know, seven, two different populations, the young students who need these experiences of, um, science engaging with science outside of the classroom um and then the more mature students and the young um professionals who are looking for ways to give back to society and also and also you know develop themselves as well yeah Yeah, that's that's a very worthwhile goal can you shed some light on some of your major milestones that you've achieved um since the inception of gh scientific Right, great. Yeah, sure. Um, so our, our first major project was one uh, funded by uh, the Wellcome Trust, uh, now the Wellcome. This was like a 15-month project where we brought together about um, 16 schools. Uh, we put them into about eight teams and they were set out with a task of, you know, identify 
um, a health challenge in your community that's of link to the environment and then design solutions um, to it. So that this project went on for over, over a year. Uh, and it was a great milestone because it was a great starting point to show that um, not only was there a need to sort of develop students in this way, but it was a very good proof of concept that we could do this and do it effectively. Um, so, so that was a great starting point. Um, since then, one of the things we've managed to do consistently is every year do a, a neuroscience experiential uh, day for students. Uh, neuroscience, of course, because I'm biased in neuroscience. Um, I, I might some way do some genetics experiential days, but we will we, we'll get it eventually. But you have like these neuroscience uh, experience days where uh, we bring together about 60 to 100 senior high school students for a day of neuroscience. They have a morning session where they engage with um, professionals in the neurosciences. So we're talking about psychologists, psychiatrists, neurologists, mm -hmm. neuropharmacologists, you know, uh, neurosurgeons, mental health practitioners, you know, an area of people that all intersect with neuroscience. They have a morning to just engage in these conversations and find out more. Then they have an afternoon session where they do some practicals, right? Some hands-on activities, some of the staples in neuroscience, some behavioral tests, you know, try out some pipetting techniques. Um, yeah, do some, you know, investigate your own nervous system. And then they, they do that really well. Like I said, I'm quite pleased that we've been able to do this on a year, on a yearly basis, um, every, every year since we, since like 2017 or so. Um, the two last landmarks I'd, I'd like to uh, touch on being, uh, just around, uh, COVID, we had another long-term uh, project once again, funded by, uh, the welcome. Um, or in these uh, neuroscience days, they are funded by the uh, International Brain Research Organization, um, IBRO. They've, they've been very great supporters um, every year. But yeah, welcome. Welcome 2019. We did this um, project called the, called the Evolution of Science. Um, and that was a very interesting one because it was, it was new for the team uh, doing something like this. What this was, was basically we sat down, we put scientists on the one hand, and we put artists on the other hand. And then we set them a little task of saying, well, get together, collaborate, and see how the artists can use their medium to tell pieces of the story of evolution of science in Ghana since independence. So, you know, mm. charting over a 60 year period, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what pieces can you do that can touch on significant things that have happened within the scientific community in, in Ghana. And it was a great show and the artists, you know, various mediums, poets, musicians, sculptors, painters, you know, writers, all did something uh, to be able to do, to create this exhibition. And then we sort of like launched the exhibition at the Museum of Science and Technology in Accra. And we had it up for about um, a month where people could come in and of course engage with the um materials we had like li little handbooks to be able to tell the story um and even at the end of the ex exhibition we've managed to you know donate pieces of it to certain places and a significant part of it still remains with the with the museum so that's that was very great because we we're able to show a sense of legacy um mm -hmm. you know recognize you know scientists that have done significant contributions um and you know the fact that it's even been donated to the museum and some of these pieces are still there means some longevity, right? Whenever right. people pass, they'll see it and it will lead to some conversations. So, so that's a, a very proud uh, founder moment or co-founder moment um, for, for us. And all of that then led us to really start um, a membership, right? Mm -hmm. So that now we are really building a community around all the work that we do so people come in you engage with us you become a part of this community and it allows us to stay true to our vision of you know building capacity in people because you can't just do touch and go events one of events and expect it to really be building capacity mm -hmm. so we, we have in a community um that we can then sort of like constantly work with constantly develop so that they too can go out and touch their individual spaces in their communities um and it's it's been 
phenomenal the sorts of changes we've seen in people that have stuck it out in the space and then what they are currently doing yeah it's, it's, it's been amazing well that's that's uh that's really amazing i'm especially touched by the um what you did in 2019 with the artists and scientists because that's yeah. that's been one of my um, main interest as well is just seeing that merge of science and art and how powerful that can be but Indeed. what i really like is the twist with which you did when you are looking at the evolution of ghana um and and it's it's just really amazing that you were able to put all of this together so that's that's really some major achievements um and with the community of um people i i think at the at, in the end that's one of the things to right like having a community yeah. that we, we can just constantly um that are constantly sharing the vision that just started in a small in 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 two two months back in 2014 um yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. um yeah, so this is, this is quite right i mean you are, you are spot on that, that that's such a great uh thing to do and, and having such a community is, is so critical to keep things going yeah yes yeah yeah i agree um so i'd like to go back to your research um that you're okay. doing um can you share some of your memorable highlights and low moments um as a lecturer, as a researcher, um, of 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 your research, what what have been has been some of those really high moments yeah. and then low. Um, time? sure, sure. So high, high moments are easier to say. Low moments <laughs> take you to a low dark place. But yeah, right. high moment. Um, so um, one one which has you know happened multiple times. Um which is you know that feeling which actually drives uh, significantly what part of the research work i do the moment where you make a discovery and you've been asking a certain research question um you run the tests and you know you have a hypothesis of some form and the tests uh, results come out you analyze it and it seems to support this hypothesis um i normally like to just pause and enjoy that moment briefly because at that moment you can really sit in and enjoy the fact that you are the only one in the whole entire world who knows that this plus that equals this right it's new knowledge you just discovered some new knowledge that nobody else knows and it's just you know something to really sit in and enjoy and, and, and appreciate that's a, a a a high a high moment another high moment um that i have and, and this will seem uh, a, a bit strange is seeing the growth in my students you know <laughs> students are coming um and initially we're talking about like research students here where initially how they ask research questions is not the best uh they don't really understand the need for controls like you know controlling every potential variable and really thinking about it and making sure that you are only playing around with one variable you know um how to consider like ways to analyze or even just approach to research design seeing students come in where they are a bit green and then by the time they're leaving you know they they are challenging your thoughts right they are, they are pushing you you know you you propose an idea and they are pushing back like no 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 this that doesn't work because of you know um yeah those those are high moments because it feels like another uh, proud supervisor moment um where you can see this it shows that work has been put in um and you know you've actually contributed to to someone else's life so so that's great low moments low moments i need to pause and breathe guys because low moments are yeah um during my training years i was so used to being able to um decide on an idea on let's say monday run it by my supervisor let's say tuesday um put in an order for the new regions you need let's say wednesday and it comes in time so that by the following week you are ready to put that idea to the test that was what i was used to it works so beautifully 
Now, low momentum in a space where sometimes the idea comes today, you put in an order tomorrow, and it may be two to three months before you get what you need. And by that time, you are wondering, wait, what was I going to do again? Um, how does this, like, it just doesn't make sense anymore. You don't even, you know, it's, yeah, it's having two to three months space between uh, ideation and actually being able to test uh, yeah, it's 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 horrible. It's probably the um, how I'd, I'd I'd like to say it, um, but we find a way around because we refuse to accept these um, low momentum or, or have to experience um, any more of them. Like everything that can be done to avoid these low lows. Uh, yeah, it's it's it's, um, it's needed. Um, on a, on a on a on a slightly different type of low um which might be considered strange by anyone who uh, hasn't done um animal work so a lot of my research we use uh, animal models uh, mice or, or, or rats um is losing an animal it feels uh strange but you know losing an animal an animal that you've been working with for uh, your research work and then and then losing the animal like the animal uh passing away unexpectedly or maybe due to the procedure, the animal passing away. Um, yeah, that ends up being a bit of a low, low moment. So we try to avoid those mm -hmm. as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, like I think those those are um, things. Um, most of the, the researchers we spoke to have some level of appreciation of, especially with the funding issue. Um, and I think it's it's something that uh, everyone is trying to see the best ways and means of going around it to able to get the, the research published or to get it funded um, to get more students in so that you able to do more things and explore more ideas. But thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah. So Tom, we'd like to end by asking what advice would you leave with young aspiring scientists in Africa um, folks who will be listening to this podcast and really gaining your experience and learning from your experience what advice would you leave with them even as they aspire to be scientists right um so for young africans and actually uh maybe just young young students um wherever you may find um yourself the advice i would give um, which i think has helped me and i've seen it help others is um your network you know join a community join a space that aligns with the vision that you have in mind um have people around you who are also as you know as bold as you may be or as ambitious as you may be or as bold as you want to be or as ambitious as you want to be have people that resonates with where you want to go regarding research um and here's the reason why that is so important. Our environment plays a very significant role on who we are and who we become and who we even aspire to be. Uh, and if you are in a space where you are surrounded by mediocreness, you may settle for mediocreness. However, if you surround yourself with people who are really um aiming for the stars you know have their moonshot ideas are really looking for excellence um that is what you will end up also aiming for so find a community find a network of people that can keep you sharp and keep you challenged it doesn't even need to be a huge network right just people like that so that regardless of what's the larger environment or the larger space you're in regardless of what challenges may be uh, pertinent in those spaces, because you have this small community that is aiming for better, seeking better, doing better, you will always attain better. And I think that's very important for um, young scientists in training or otherwise to, to bear in mind. Yeah, that's powerful. It's like, you know, it seems like the central message 
is constantly being about having a community around you that will help you at ev at every stage of your life and i think that's a powerful message for our listeners and so um dr thomas we thank you so much for today thank you for sharing your experience um telling us a little bit about neuroscience and also about gh scientific it's it's been a pleasure um listening to you and it's it's been very engaging um and so to our listeners as usual you can find us on facebook as sunny on instagram as at sunny podcast and on youtube as sunny podcast don't forget to like share and subscribe um, and as usual, leave comments on today's episode on, on episodes that you might um, ask to bring your way and see you at our next session. Thank you so much. Bye. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye.